Hey, how's it going guys? Mr. Boss for the win here, and in today's Red Dead Redemption 2 video, we're going to be taking a look at the untold story of the Vanderlyn gang, their rise and eventual fall, and all the details that the game really doesn't tell you about. So that's pretty much the theme throughout both stories, particularly in the first Red Dead Redemption game where, you know, John Marston is on the run and he has to hunt down his former gang members. A lot of the time you're wondering why and what happened to the entire gang and why they still aren't together. And then you see in Red Dead Redemption 2 the eventual collapse, but we still don't understand what made them rise to power and their background. So it all starts in the mid-1870s, about 15 to 20 years before Red Dead Redemption 2 begins. And this is where the meeting of two fateful robbers occur, Dutch Vanderlyn and Hosea Matthews. So Dutch and Hosea met each other at a campfire on the road to Chicago, where Hosea actually attempted to con and rob Dutch, but realized that Dutch had done the exact same thing and stolen from him in the meantime. They both saw the skill that the other had and they laughed it off, and they decided to team up and face the future together. And thus the Vanderlyn gang was founded. And around the same time, Hosea met a woman named Bessie, who would eventually become his wife. Now during this time, Dutch convinced Hosea, who described himself as a degenerate, that they could find redemption by robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. Dutch had a very anarchistic vision of the world without government or corporate interference, and he envisioned a savage utopia free from the pressures and intolerance of civilization. And he also saw himself as a revolutionary and thought that the gang could be an example to others who would follow their lead. And they began pulling tricks and ripping off people they believed deserved it the most. In fact, they tell a story on March 9, 1877, wherein the pair found themselves in the town of Kettering, Ohio, where they began conning several people. They posed as international merchants, conning 12 locals into buying $300 worth of shares into a fictional Portuguese shipping company. They were eventually discovered and arrested by Sheriff Carmichael, but the pair managed to escape their cell by unknown means. And in the meantime, they tied up and robbed the sheriff in the process. Now, shortly after escaping jail, the pair stumbled across a 14-year-old orphan named Arthur Morgan. He was an unruly child, and they decided to take him under their wing teaching him to read, write, shoot, and other useful skills. Now, around this same time, Dutch became romantically involved with a woman named Susan Grimshaw, who also became a member of the gang. Now, the gang acted as a family, spending long nights playing poker and other games, and Bessie taught Arthur how to play dominoes. Now, at some point, the gang acquired a pet dog named Copper, who Arthur grew very close to, and took care of. Now during these early years, Hosea and his wife Bessie tried to go straight and took a trip through the states like New Hanover and Lemoyne. However, Hosea slowly drifted back to the gang, unable to fight against his own criminal nature. Bessie understood his struggle and stuck by him, and Dutch ended his relationship with Susan Grimshaw and at some point in time later became romantically involved with a woman named Annabelle. Now, flash forward a couple of years to 1885, four years before our story in Red Dead Redemption 2, Dutch came across a group of Illinois homesteaders preparing to hang a young boy for stealing from them. He saved the child named John Marston and brought him into the gang, teaching him to read and shoot just as he had done with Morgan. And Arthur and John became like brothers. And Dutch often used to read books to them by Evelyn Miller and Waldo Emerson. Even though most of the concepts and stories that Dutch read to them went right over the young boys' heads. Now, Dutch educated Arthur and John on his anarchistic worldview, instilling them with distrust and hatred for the government. And he told them that America was designed to produce apathy in people. He would preach that revenge was a fool's game and that they should never kill in cold blood. Now, over the years, many members of the gang came to believe that John was Dutch's favorite and the golden boy, much to the envy of others. Now, two years later, in 1887, the gang committed its first bank robbery, 
At 2 o'clock, Hosea, Dutch, and Arthur burst into the banking house of Lee and Hoyt. Arthur held a firearm to the teller and demanded he throw his hands up. Dutch then proclaimed, My fine patriotic friends and I are going to relieve you of some of that gold and introduce a few folks to the benefit of civilization. The gang made off with $5,000 in gold, and after the robbery, they lingered in town, going to hotels, shanties, and orphanages, handing out money. It was around this time, likely because of this bank robbery, that Dutch became a wanted man with a price on his head. And between 1887 and 1889, the gang carried out roughly 37 different bank robberies in various locations around the country. Now, at one point in the past, Dutch and Como Driscoll, the leader of the O'Driscoll boys, had an uneasy truce between them. Dutch disliked how Colm treated his men as disposable, and Colm mocked Dutch for his philosophies about trying to make a better world. Though the exact reason is unknown, Dutch broke the truce when he killed Colm's brother. However, in retaliation, Colm killed Dutch's lover, Annabelle, an event which greatly angered and devastated him. And these events led to a blood feud between the two gangs that would last for years. Now, during the early years of the gang, they truly did help people in need and tried to make a difference. Dutch even scolded Arthur for stealing from a poor man's house, saying that it made them no better than the people they were fighting against. As the years went on, Dutch gradually became disillusioned with society as the world around him grew more and more organized and civilized, with increasing government centralization continuing to encroach on his idea of freedom. So the gang eventually stopped giving money to the poor and helping others, and instead focused exclusively on caring for themselves and securing their own survival. Dutch even allowed the gang to become involved in loan sharking through Leopold Strauss, which often targeted the type of lower class people the gang previously used to fight for. Instead of just thieving, the gang also began killing, much to Hosea's dismay. Despite his objections, Hosea stuck around out of loyalty to Dutch, though his faith in their mission gradually declined and eventually vanished over the years. Now, for the next six years, the gang traveled through the frontier, performing many other heists and crimes according to Dutch's values. In this time, the gang picked up around a dozen new members, usually people who wished to escape and live outside of the conventional society. It is unclear exactly when these gang members joined, but it includes the likes of members like Mac and Davy Callender, who were brothers described as a vicious pair of bastards and served as gunmen for the gang, Karen Jones, who was a con artist and trigger woman, Mary Beth Gaskell was a young woman who was taken in by the gang as she was being chased by someone she had just pickpocketed, Tilly Jackson left her previous gang after she killed a cousin of Anthony Foreman's, who is the gang leader, and she lived on the street until Dutch, who took her in and taught her to read, just as she had done for Morgan and Marston. Simon Pearson was a former Navy chief who was rescued by Dutch from other loan sharks. He would become the camp cook. Orville Swanson, a reverend with both severe alcoholism and a morphine addiction, saved Dutch's life once. And as thanks, Dutch offered him a permanent place in the gang. Uncle was a petty thief and drunk who joined the gang. Due to his personality, he earned the reputation of a bit of a freeloader with the gang, but they let him stay due to his ability to entertain them and do whatever they wanted when asked. Sean McGuire was a young Irishman who attempted to rob and kill Dutch and Hosea in North Elizabeth, but was later adopted into the gang. Molly O'Shea was a woman who abandoned her rich family in search of adventure and romance. It's unclear how she joined the gang, but she later became Dutch's lover. The eccentric Josiah Trelaney was another con artist who formed an association with the gang. He would act as an informant for Dutch on both large and small-scale heist opportunities. However, due to his line of work, he was allowed to come and go from the gang as he pleased never becoming directly involved with most of the other members besides Dutch himself. And at one point in time, an unarmed member betrayed the gang, but was later caught and killed in the gang's camp for it. Now, a couple of years later, in 1893, a drunk veteran named Bill Williamson attempted to rob Dutch, but Dutch simply laughed at him. This infuriated Bill at first, but Dutch cheered him up and took him into the gang, giving him a purpose and a reason to live. Bill lacked conventional intelligence, but he made up for it with his unfailing loyalty to Dutch and the gang. 
Now, a year later, in 1894, Uncle introduced the gang to a prostitute named Abigail Roberts, who joined the gang and had sexual relations with several members of the gang. Abigail eventually started a relationship with John and soon became pregnant. John refused to accept responsibility for the child, insisting that it was not his. The baby, whose name was Jack, was subsequently raised by the gang as he grew up to know many of the gang members like aunts and uncles since the gang considered themselves all family. However, when Jack was about a year old, John abandoned his son and the gang, and this greatly angered Arthur who saw it as an act of great betrayal. About a year later, John returned to the gang. While Dutch and many other members may have welcomed him back with open arms, Arthur never truly forgave John for his actions, and this would lead to a rift between the two brothers that would eventually steadily grow over the next few years. Now, one year later in 1895, while stealing chickens, Dutch came across a young Mexican exile named Javier Escuela, who was also stealing chickens just to survive. Javier was starving and alone, so Dutch took him into the gang, feeding and clothing him. Javier, a former revolutionary, had a strong affinity with the gang's philosophy and began to idolize Dutch. Javier would become one of the most loyal gunmen in the gang. Now, three years later, by 1898, the gang found itself in Montana. Jose caught several large salmon, planning a feast for the whole camp until Copper found and ate the fish. Now, sometime after this, Copper passed away. After a fire and some trouble in the north, the gang traveled south and east, taking a slow and torturous trail down through the northern grizzlies to throw anyone off the tracks. They spent several months in the wilderness, and during this winter, they stuck mostly to the western foothills of the mountain. Food was plentiful, and for a time, the gang lived in peace. Dutch eventually got a lead on some land for the gang to buy for their savage utopia. But it did not match up to Dutch's criteria, or he grew suspicious that law enforcement was watching them, and the gang began wandering again. While traversing the Grizzlies, the gang picked up several new recruits. The first of these new recruits were Lenny Summers and Charles Smith. At first, Hosea was unsure of Lenny, but the two grew mutually respect for each other and became good friends. Lenny was literate even before joining the gang and tried to use his knowledge to teach Sean how to read. Charles was used to surviving alone, but was surprised by how fairly Dutch treated him despite his race and decided to stick around having found a place he felt he belonged in. The gang also picked up two new members around this time as well. Jenny Kirk, who was found abandoned on the roadside, and Micah Bell, who saved Dutch's life. Dutch met Micah at a place named Crenshaw Hill while trying to sell gold that the gang had recently stolen. Dutch ended up offering some of the locals, leading to an altercation where Micah stepped in and saved his life. And this leads us to 1899. The gang arrived in the state of West Elizabeth, and decided to camp outside of the town of Blackwater, a town undergoing the process of industrialization. Eventually, Micah convinced Dutch to rob a riverboat, carrying money from the bank. Arthur and Hosea protested, believing the risks were too great to be involved. Despite this, Dutch thought the heist would be worth the risk and went ahead with it. They scoped out several safe spots in the state of New Austin for the gang to use as a fallback after the robbery. The heist did not go as planned, with the Pinkertons arriving suspiciously quickly, and everything took a turn for the worse, and a gunfight ensued between the gang and the law. In the heat of the moment, Dutch cracked and killed an innocent girl named Heidi McCourt, in a very cruel way, according to Javier. John, Jenny Kirk, Mac, and Davy were all shot in the ensuing chaos, but managed to escape, for the time being. The latter two had much more severe injuries than John, and they died afterwards shortly. Sean and Mac ended up separated from the rest of the gang from each other. Mac apparently didn't make it very far. He was discovered by Detective Andrew Milton. On the verge of death from injuries sustained in a fight, Detective Milton attempted to question him about the gang, but Mac refused to rat out his gang until the very end. He was promptly killed by the detective, who had gone to sarcastically describe it as a mercy killing. And we know that Sean escaped Blackwater, but was eventually captured by bounty hunters who planned to sell him over to the Pinkertons. Now, that last event right there that took place in 1899 is known as the Blackwater Massacre. And if you guys are interested in all the details surrounding that event, I highly recommend you check out a video I did a couple of months ago. I'll leave a link to it in the description that talks about all the details of that event that we never got to see. 
But anyways, that right there is the untold story of the Vanderlyn gang in Red Dead Redemption 2, and that gets you caught up to all the events prior to Red Dead Redemption 2. To this day, I still believe that a DLC or some sort of story expansion that focuses on all these events that happened before the story would be really cool, but it looks like Rockstar's focus is going to be more on multiplayer and whatever titles they have next. But anyways, that's all the information that I've got for you guys in this video today. Hopefully you did enjoy. If you did go on to enjoy this video, though, a like rating would of course be awesome. And be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you are new. You want to stay up to date on all the latest GTA and Red Dead Redemption videos that I'm doing here on my channel. And be sure to ring that notification bell as well. Sometimes YouTube just doesn't work. And if you ring that bell, you'll always be guaranteed to be notified when new videos arrive. But of course, as always, guys, thank you all so much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you guys in the next video.